Well, the format this evening is that I'm going to give you um, a brief talk on the topic of surprise by suffering. And uh, after I finish the uh, talk, I will also invite my colleague Charles to come and join uh, me in fielding your questions. And so if you have your questions, I would uh, request you to kindly uh, write it or keep it in your mind so that at least we can have a meaningful time of interaction as well. Now, uh, before I dive in to the very topic, I just want to give you a little bit of a background as to why I have chosen the topic of surprise by suffering. Now, this whole topic of evil and suffering can be probably seen from different perspective. It can be seen from a philosophical point of view. It can be seen from an existential point of view. It can be seen from a theological point of view. But then, what I'm going to do this evening is to probably bring mostly the practical aspect of the whole area of suffering. And uh, uh, personally, in my own life, uh, I'm sure as it would be true for any one of you here, that uh, there is none, probably I can say, who has not gone through suffering. Right? All of us, one way or the other, we all have experience, we all have either met people who have suffered, we have friends, family members who have gone through the thick and thin of life. And so all of us in one way or the other, we have suffered. And so I'm going to come and look at this topic from that point of view, that when you embrace and when you go through suffering, at the end of the day, at the end of your experience, personally speaking in my own life, I've been surprised by the very fact of suffering. Now, and you will come to see as to why I have titled it Surprise by Suffering. Now, which of us who probably have encountered and seen people who have suffered in their life, such as perhaps a deformed child or someone who has gone through so much of suffering, and after we have encountered or after we have seen, a question that comes to our mind is the whole purpose behind it. Why is it that some people suffer the way that they suffer? And then furthermore, you also get into the area where people have experienced loss in their life. A mother losing her child. And then the question always arises as to why? None of us will not have that question of why do we have to go through suffering. Sooner or later in our life, in our experiences, all of us, we will come back with this whole idea of why. The big question is why. Very often the problem of evil and suffering itself will be or tend to be a great obstacle for people to even come and believe in God. And that is an undeniable fact. Now there is one singer, a man by the name of Justin Hayward. He was a British singer, musician, and he was part of the Moody Blues years ago. And he, in his song, has these lyrics or these words, and I quote, he says, Why do we never get an answer when we are knocking at the door with a thousand million questions about hate, death, and war. Why don't we get an answer when we knock at the door about suffering, about struggles, about war, about death, and about hatred? Why don't we get an answer was the question that he had raised in his song. Now when I ponder both the extent and the depth of the suffering in the world, whether due to man's doing or it could be because of a natural nature's catastrophe that can happen and that can cause a loss of life, irrespective of whatever it may be, the question of God's existence always come to the forefront. And that is inevitable. But then I'm reminded also of what G.K. Chesterton, a philosopher and apologist, once said. He says, when belief in God becomes difficult, the tendency is to turn away from him. 
When belief in God becomes difficult, the tendency is to turn away from Him. And then he, went, he goes on to say, but in heaven's name, to what? When belief in God tends to become difficult, the tendency is to turn away from Him, but in heaven's name, to what? Is the very question that he raises. Now, as a follower of Christ, as a believer in the Christian faith, I acknowledge that there is a need for sound response to the question of evil and suffering. But then on the other hand, I also understand that those who turn away from God still will need a response to be given on the very fact. Well, whether you like it or not, whether you belong to the Christian faith or you belong to any other faith or probably to no faith at all. There are people also who do not identify with any of the formal faith. Irrespective of the perspective you have, irrespective of the worldview, everyone needs to give a reason or to give probably a perspective on the problem of evil and suffering. The Bible, on the other hand, does not shy away. The Bible does not shy away from the problem of evil and suffering. In fact, all of you would be familiar that the book of Job is one of the oldest in the Bible that addresses the problem of evil and suffering. The prophets of the Old Testament also similarly raise the issue as well. Habakkuk asks the question, why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? The prophets in the past have raised. David cried out in the Psalm 64 verse 1. He says, hear me, O God, as I voice my complaint. Protect my life from the threats of the enemy. Hide me from the conspiracy of the wicked. Jonah, the prophet again in the Old Testament, was fearful of the violent Ninevites. That he so much went on to pray to God that God may wipe away the whole nation of Nineveh. Jeremiah challenged the Lord by asking this question. I would speak to you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? The Bible, just in the Old Testament alone, raises the question of evil and suffering. And thankfully, the God of the Bible seems to be a God who entertains such questions. So it's okay to have questions. At least from a biblical perspective, it does not shy away. It does not discourage people from raising the question. So today, I'm going to also look from the Christian perspective of the reason of why there is evil and suffering. Now, there are two ways in which I'm going to look at it. Number one, there is always this issue of the rationale, or that is the intellect. There are people who have intellectual problem. They do not want to believe in God and their question is actually in this format. That if there is a God, a loving God, as the Christians would actually say. But then the question is, why there is so much of evil and suffering in this world? And when they pose this question, it is in the context of if God is loving and there is suffering, then he ought to actually intervene. But if God does not intervene, then basically it means that there is no God to actually intervene. So basically they look at the problem of evil and suffering and they come to the conclusion that since there is no God to deal with the problem of evil and suffering, therefore, therefore they come to the conclusion that there is no God. So evil and suffering here is being used as an argument to disprove the very existence of God. Right? That is number one, the first part. The other part is the emotional, the emotional aspect of the whole uh, problem of evil and suffering. People, don't ne people who believe in God, some of them, uh, maybe there is a different way of how we respond to the problem. They may not necessarily be atheists. It is easy to actually talk about the theoretical explanation of the problem of evil and suffering. But it's a different ballgame when you yourself go through that. I remember yesterday as we were talking in the Q&A, and if you are there, pardon me for sharing the story again. I have a cousin sister of mine who is much more older in fact, and her son, the eldest son, was of my age, and he was my contemporary. We grew up together. So this cousin was um, much, much more older. 
But then on the other hand, she is also someone who has accomplished much in life. She has her own school. She has contested in elections. She is fully rich. She comes from a very noble family background. Her father was a civil servant in the government of India. He was an IAS officer, right? The Indian Administ Administrative Service. Now, one day what happened was her son actually, while partying along with his friends in their farmhouse, and as they were partying there, so somewhere in midnight, he drove his car and actually ran through this tree and the vehicle toppled many times. And after that accident, immediately he was taken to the hospital wherein he was in the ICU for several weeks. And I remember when we heard the news, all of us had rushed towards the hospital. All of us, family, friends, and you can imagine because of her personality, the hospital was actually packed with different people. And I remember after finishing some meetings, and I, I ha had also gone, and as I went there, and there she was standing uh, in that she does not have any expression. She was simply standing there. She was not crying. She was not doing anything, but she was like a stone. And as we went there, and I was walking very silently, and then looking for an opportunity that somehow I will be able to just give her a hug. It was no time for giving any response. But then as soon as she saw me, she knew because I was part of the Ars that I am ministry. She knew that I am a servant of God. And then she looked at me, and believe it or not, in the midst of many other people, she angrily asked me this question. Where is God? Why doesn't God spare this, the life of my son? Believe me, I have done a lot of study and reading on the problem. But I knew for sure that I think it would, the best response at that point of time is to be quiet. Is to be quiet. When you go through emotional, when you go through an experiential uh, testing in your life, only you will know, you know, as there is a proverb in my language which basically says that it is only they who has, their, who has a nail in their shoes and this nail is pricking them. They only will understand the pain and nobody else will understand. Such is the problem of evil and suffering from an emotional point of view where they are angry with God. They do not necessarily deny the existence of God, but they are angry with God. Why does God allow this suffering to happen in my life? Why doesn't God spare the life of my son? And that is the struggle. Now let me actually just give you quickly the intellectual response to it and then I will dwell for the rest of my talk on the emotional aspect to it. You know the intellectual or the mind, there are people who have problems with belief in God but their problem is basically rational as I have just explained to you. You know, if God does not exist, Friedrich Nietzsche who is the philosopher of the 19th century, he in fact was the one who influenced Hitler much. Hitler was not someone who was well read in his life. But the only philosopher that he read much in his life was Friedrich Nietzsche. And Friedrich Nietzsche is the one who has popularized his essay on the theme of God is dead. God is dead. But Friedrich Nietzsche went on to actually understand the implication that if God is dead, Along with God, there is also a loss in meaning and value in life. He went on to also understand and to say that if God is then, then there is no way for us to understand the existence of values, moral values in our life. So basically, he understood that. But then, I have kind of understood this problem in this way. We need to be very careful of while talking about the existence of God or the lack of the existence of God and the existence of moral values. I'm sure you all understand the moral values, the universal objective moral value. If something is wrong, it is not only that you have thought it out together in, in, in Sri Lanka. But this is true everywhere. So if you were to go to our country or if you were to go to the West, everywhere, they all know that it is wrong to lie. 
That is what we mean by objective. That means it is true irrespective of what beliefs you hold. So Friedrich Nietzsche understood that. But the problem and the care that we need to take is this. Must we believe in God in order to live moral lives? Must we believe in God? Do I need to believe in God in order to live an ethically an ethical life? Now I know of some atheists whose life is very ethical and yet they do not believe in God. Right? I'm not claiming that, that we must. But then there is another issue and another question and the question is this. Can we recognize the existence of such universal objective values without believing in God? Now again, the answer to this, I think that we still can. Without actually believing in God, we still see the existence of moral value. But I think the linchpin or the important question, the last nail on the coffin is this. If God does not exist, do values exist? That would be the question. I'm not saying that a person who does not believe in God does not have the right to live a moral life. And I'm neither saying that those people, in order to actually believe in moral values, we need to have God. But the question that we need to understand is if God does not exist, if God does not exist in this universe, then thus values is justified. Thus moral values exist is a question that we need to understand. And my response to that is it is difficult. Because if we deny that, then we are left to what people call as a hurt men, uh, morality, wherein a group of people will come together and say, okay, let's now decide what is to be a right thing and what is to be a wrong thing. Let us all come together and probably say, okay, if rape is disadvantaged to our culture, then let's consider rape as something that is wrong. Now, that is a cultural thing. And let's say in other places where they find that it is advantageous, then they will say it's good we would be left to a value, a moral value, which will be different from one place to the other. So intellectually, I would propose that it is difficult. Without the existence of God, you cannot make sense of the existence of moral values. So that's my intellectual response to that. Now, as I promise you, that my whole thrust today will not be on the intellectual part. Because I'm sure my suspicion is many of you probably have read it or are familiar with some of the arguments from the Christian perspective or from a theistic perspective. But today I'm going to actually look at the emotional aspect of it, the emotional aspect of it. Now, a few years ago, there was this book that was released and the book, uh, book's title was, Does He Know a Mother's Heart? Does he know a mother's heart? How suffering refutes religion. Now this book was written by a famous politician in India, a man by the name of Arun Shauri. Arun Shauri belongs to the BGP uh, party once upon a time, now he is anti. But then he has a son who is having some issues, health issues ever since he was born. And so they, they live in Pune and uh, he is a prolific writer, he used to be a journalist, and he wrote this book, Does He Know a Mother's Heart? How Suffering Refutes Religion. So his whole thesis or his whole argument is that because of suffering, I think religion is actually being ejected out. So that is what Arun Shauri is saying. In other words, what he is saying is suffering and God cannot go hand in hand. Suffering and God cannot go hand in hand. So that was his thesis. But in essence, the crux of the argument is that we do not know the explanation of why people suffer. And that is why some people like Arun Shauri have come to the conclusion that there is no God. But my proposal is that just because we do not know the explanation of why you are currently going through suffering, that does not mean that there is no reason. Now, may I repeat that again? If you look at the scripture, the Bible tells us at least in a very general sense of why people go through suffering. I very often used to respond by saying the Christian faith actually gives us uh, explanations about why people go through suffering. 
it may not actually tell you and me specifically as to why currently now you are in some kind of a crisis. Now the Bible may not tell you that. But definitely it does give us some clue, some hint with regard to why we go through suffering. So I believe just because we do not know the reason of why we are suffering, that does not mean that there is no reason. There are reasons for us to actually believe that we go through suffering because of that. Now let me present to you four important things as to why I think that there is explanation for that. Now the sources from which I actually look at all of this is basically number one, I look from our own personal experience. Okay? our own personal experience. I will actually elaborate on that. Secondly, we also go back and look at tradition. Tradition basically means the experiences of other people. Let's say, if suppose today, now I am of a particular age where my son now is five years old, but when he grows, he will ask the question of why uh, we suffer. And probably I, because of my experience, because of my years of existence, I may be in a better position to actually give him a perspective of why we go through suffering. Similarly, when we look at tradition, when we look back at church history, when we look back in the past, there are wisdoms that we can gain from by looking at the experiences of people who have gone before us who can tell us something about suffering. So first one is what? From our own personal experience, we learn. Secondly, we look from tradition, okay, experiences of other people. Thirdly, we also look at reason. Reason basically meaning can we make sense? If we look at common sense, why do people suffer? So let us look at some of the reasons from that perspective. And fourthly, does the Christian faith or does your faith and my faith in God give us any, uh, uh, any reason or any valid point of why we go through suffering? So number one, experience. Secondly, it's tradition. Thirdly, it is reason. And then fourthly, it is looking at the Christian faith, looking at Christianity, looking at the Bible. What does it speak to our life? Okay, so four important things. Let me begin with the first one. And uh, hereafter, it's quite simple. The first one and the foremost is the issue of building one's character. First and foremost is the issue of building one's character. Now, for instance, it is a common universal human experience that limited physical affliction in our life, which can probably be known as disciplines, can help us in our own building up of our own character, right? I remember when we were studying in the university, my dad who came and dropped me in the university, he used to tell me one thing. Son, if you want to wear a crown of jewels or pearls, you must first wear the crown of thorns. And then he would follow up with letter writings, telling me, no pain, no gain. So basically you have to sit, we used to say when you sit on, in your chair, uh, on your chair and study, we used to say that sit till actually boils come up and then you will have get better marks. Now I don't know about that wisdom, but the whole point is this, that if no pain, no gain. So character can be built with discipline. Character can be built with some pain that is also there. Now, Helen Keller, an American education, uh, author and a political activist and a lecturer, she said like this, and I quote, Character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened, vision cleared, ambition inspired, and success achieved. I'll read once again. Character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened, vision cleared, ambition inspired, and success achieved. There is a physician in England who lived a long time ago, and he was a philosopher as well. His name is John Locke. And he went on to the extent of suggesting parents that they should give their children leaky shoes as they go to school and not to, be, not to pamper them and give them, you know, uh, good, good stuff, but give them leaky shoes, you know, shoes that actually have holes. 
and that when they go to school they will know the struggle and they will know the pain that is what he is basically saying and with the objective that at the end of the day they will know the pain of life they will know the struggle of life all of us cannot deny the fact that sometimes you have to use your cane punishment is also very important if you want to drive home an important point right i know my son is growing and very often when we tell him do not do that he does not listen and he's got used to some of the pampering and sometimes i've had to take a cane and actually spank him from time to time because the bible tells us that if you spare the rod you spoil the child some amount of punishment some amount of suffering inflicting upon the child will bring about a good character so the first important suffering is one it is in building one's character secondly the issue is of imparting moral lessons secondly it is in imparting moral lessons you know god allows suffering so that we might have the capacity to actually understand other people's suffering also have you ever noticed that it is only after you have gone through suffering that you will understand actually how to uh, you know um, comfort someone else if you have not gone through you will not be able to explain the other day i went to cmc hospital this is a christian medical college and uh, i took my mother actually for check up and uh, i also took the uh, priv- uh, the liberty to actually get myself also check up and so but uh, unfortunately it was not only check up but the doctor actually advised endoscopy you know if you know endoscopy they will put that whole pipe down here just to check and i actually complained to the doctor that i have some t- stomach upset and this is a concern but the doctor after i have paid a huge amount of money and the fees for him now how can i forego that so i had to do i have never done it before and charles was telling me you did endoscopy my goodness and i was just wondering i said now at least after i have done if he if he were to ever get endoscopy i'll be the first one to pick up the phone and tell him it's all right brother it's all right it's bearable but then at that point of time i'll tell you it was so difficult 3 minutes for me seemed to be like eternity i was telling the doctor ah it was just <laughs> it was so painful you know it's only when you go through suffering that you can be of a blessing to someone else you know the whole idea that we used to say that you know if you have missed the train or probably if you have uh, gone through something in life yeah, and then you can see remember those days when we were young you know we are not like the children today yeah we never used to go in a car we used to go walking and you now children you have to go now young people i'm just actually comparing the generation but the point is we tend to actually say you know we were not better off at that point of time we had to go through struggle yeah and so on and so forth but then it also becomes a reason for us to actually bond together bonding togetherness it brings people and then if you look from a from a larger perspective point of view people who have gone through nations not only individual but groups and nations if they have been persecuted or they have struggled because of some big issue all of them as a nation will come together you know i'm sure all of you have read the news of uh, how in india we uh, you know a couple of days ago or a couple of weeks ago uh, we had uh, 40 soldiers of our soldiers who actually died because of an explosion and uh, well some of them also got carried away with so many things the whole news channel the whole country we were like very angry and upset so i think it was only during that time that we were united because we were all inflicted it's very difficult to find unity in india but it's only times like that that we all can come in one voice that something needs to be done something needs to be done so it brings togetherness in the midst of suffering suffering actually brings people together it breaks barriers and so on and so forth thirdly god can even allow us to go through some pain in order to get our attention in life listen to this once again god can even allow us to go through some pain in order to get our attention in life friends i'll tell you this is from my experience 
I have had the privilege of praying alongside people who have suffered miserably. And many of them have lost their life through cancer. But then I have also had the privilege of sitting by their bedside, holding their hand and praying for them. It is the only solace that they can get. Some of them, in fact, all their life have never had the time to pay their attention to God. One of my friends, a classmate of mine, and this uh, man, he has lived his entire life uh, with his whole philosophy that he is the captain of his own heart and the leader of his own soul. And nobody else has any right to judge him. And he's lived like that. And so at the end of the day, when he suffered from cancer, especially stomach cancer, and now he's passed away. It was last year that he passed uh, away. And I had the privilege of reaching out to him. And at that point of time, I found that it was the only way for me to get an entry into his life. And in fact, he held on unto my hand and he said, he said, Bala, if God were to heal me, if God were to heal me, I promise you that I will dedicate my life to God. But it's too late to think about how you would have lived your life. But nevertheless, I have counseled him that God is a healer. And healing does not only mean physical. Healing means reconciliation. Reconciliation with God. So I had the privilege of leading him to God. But then C.S. Lewis also says in one of his books, The Problem of Pain, God whispers to us in our pleasure. He speaks to us in our conscience. But he shouts to us in our pain. God whispers to us when you are having fun in life, when you are having pleasure in life, sometimes you can only hear that feeble voice in your heart where God is saying, don't do my child, don't do it. But then sometimes you tend to silence that voice. But then C.S. Lewis says, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us through our conscience, but he shouts to us in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a morally deaf world. It is his megaphone to actually awake this morally deaf world. God gets our attention. It is only during the time of suffering. And I think that is very, very important. Last but not the least. Some pain in life serves as a warning of dangers ahead of us. Some pain in life serve as a warning for the danger that is ahead of us. It gives us a signal that there is danger and so you are inflicting, inflicted with pain. There is one fascinating book that I have read a couple of years ago. And that book is entitled as The Gift of Pain, written jointly by two important people. One is Dr. Paul Brand, and then the other one is Philip Yancey. Dr. Paul Brand worked, uh, worked in India uh, in CMC Hospital where Charles was also uh, working and he studied there. And he worked with leprosy patients. And in this particular book, The Gift of Pain, now look at the title itself, it's very catchy. It tells a story of one four-year-old girl by the name of Tanya. Tanya was just four years old and Tanya one day was taken to the hospital because she had a swollen left ankle. And then when she was taken to the hospital, Paul Brand had the privilege of examining her. And as he was examining her, he found out that the whole ankle was actually uh, rotating the full angle itself. And yet this four-year-old girl was not even crying. She was least bothered about what was happening. She was busy looking here and there. And then, in fact, in this very story, it tells us more about the, Tanya's history. Let me read to you. Tanya seemed fine as an infant. Her mother told the doctor this story. Tanya seemed fine as an infant. A little high-spirited maybe, but perfectly normal. I'll never forget the first time I realized she had a serious problem. Tanya was 17 or 18 months old. Usually I kept her in the same room with me. But that day, I left her alone in her playpen while I was to answer the phone. 
A few minutes later, I went into Tanya's room and found her sitting on the floor of the playpen, finger painting red swirls on the white plastic sheet. I didn't grasp the situation at first, but when I got closer, I screamed. It was horrible. The tip of Tanya's finger was mangled and bleeding, and it was her own blood that she was using to make those designs on the sheets. I yelled, Tanya, what happened? She grinned at me, and that's when I saw the streaks of blood on her teeth. She had bitten off the tip of her finger and was playing in the blood. To complicate matters, she was now a single mother. After a year of trying to cope with Tanya, her husband had even left the family. If you insist, said the husband, on keeping Tanya at home, then I quit. He had announced, and then he goes on to say, "We have begotten a monster. We have begotten a monster." Later on, Tanya was diagnosed to be suffering from a, a, a disease called as a congenital indifference to pain. The only problem is that she never feels pain. She did not feel pain. And Paul Brand goes on to actually say, and I like what he says, and I quote: "Tanya and others like her dramatically reinforce what we had already learned from leprosy patients: pain is not the enemy." But the loyal scout announcing the enemy, and yet here is the central paradox of my life: after spending a lifetime among people who destroy themselves for lack of pain, I still find it difficult to communicate an appreciation for pain to people who have no such defect. Pain truly is the gift nobody wants. I can think of nothing more precious for those who suffer from congenital painlessness, leprosy. Diabetes and other nerve disorders, but people who already own this gift rarely value it. Usually, they resent it. We know we we don't like pain, and here Paul Brand is saying it's a gift that nobody wants. But then at the same time, we forget that it is a gift because it is of of pain that you can understand the danger that is ahead of us. I'm sure all of us would have looked back and remembered the time when we sit at least in the dentist chair. All of us opening our mouth and allowing the dentist all along to actually pull our teeth or to probably work on some of the decaying teeth. But then, the doctor's short-term pain that is inflicted on you it is actually to prevent you from getting a bigger pain in the future. Some pain. Is essential. Some suffering is important in our life. It is then that you and I probably can understand. So, what does the Christian give us? What's the Christian faith gives us in the midst of suffering? What does Christian faith actually say when you and I go through suffering? Very often, when we talk about suffering, I find it fascinating that many Christians immediately go to Job. Rightly so. They go to Job, but have you ever noticed that when you read the whole story of Job, it is all about these friends who actually come and explain to him why he is going through suffering. And very often, people tend to actually miss when they study the book of Job, and they think that it is all about God giving them a reason for why Job is suffering. But let me tell you, it is not the explanation that Job was satisfied at the end of his story. What do you think he was satisfied when he comes to the end of all that he has gone through, the suffering and the pain? In Job chapter forty-two, verse five, he says, "My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Oh, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you." You see, the answer to the explanation of all the suffering that we go through in life. It's not a rational explanation. It's not a theoretical idea that can probably tell you that now this is the reason. But the answer is a person who comes alongside, and then who stands, who understands what you and I are going through. You know, when you really look at the person of Jesus Christ, he is the one figure who is not only the founder, but he is the savior. Of each one of us, the cross, right at the very center, sits at the very center of the Christian faith, 
And the cross is the expression of all the suffering that one can go through. It's the painful, excruciating pain that Christ had, have had to go through. It is only because of you and me. He understands what you are going through. So when you go to this God and talk to him about pain, suffering, he's someone who understands because he has gone through. Listen to this story. Story is told of a man by the name of Ili Wiesel. Ili Wiesel was a survivor from the Holocaust. You know, the concentration camp during Hitler's time. And Ili Wiesel tells a story of a time when he, along with other prisoners, were actually made to witness the hanging of three Jewish kids, three Jewish men, out of which two were men and one was a kid. And this kid was very thin, he was very lean, and whereas the other two people were heavy. And so when these people were all made to gather together to just witness the hanging of these three people, two of them instantaneously died. Whereas the third one, that is the young kid, he was, suff he was struggling as he was being hung there. He did not die immediately. And as they were standing there, Ili Wiesel said that one who was standing beside him, he heard him say, where is God? Where is God? Where is God? And Ili Wiesel confessed that even he had that same question that was said by this man who was standing beside him. It was echoing in his own heart as well, asking and raising the question, where is God? Where is God? Where is God? Ili Wiesel being uh, someone who is, um, you know, a prolific reader and writer, he himself said that at the end of the day, there was suddenly a voice that came up, and I don't know from where. And the answer, when he was asking, where is God, where is God? And he said that the answer came to his lip that says, there, hanging in the gallows, where else? There, hanging in the gallows, where else? And that is basically the response. But you know, when you really think of evil and suffering, very often we tend to look at suffering and evil that is outside of us. But friends, I want to tell you that evil before it is outside, it is first inside. Evil and suffering that we see outside of us, we see bomb blasts, we see people dying, we, we tend to raise the question of the evil that we see outside. But very often we tend to forget that evil before it is outside, it is first inside. Let me give you an illustration and then I will come to the last point. Ravi Zacharias tells us the whole team of his conversation that he had with one top businessman in New York. And it seems that this meeting with this man, this businessman, was arranged by a friend of his. And this friend of his actually was concerned about this friend, the businessman. And so he said that, you know, Ravi, I want you to meet this man. He's a top businessman in New York. And then this man actually has a lot of questions about God, about evil, suffering, and so on and so forth. And Ravi Zacharias uh, agreed. And so they went to his office, sitting right there at the top of this building, it seems. And as they were sitting, and this man was asking questions about evil and suffering, Ravi Zacharias was giving him the response, both philosophically, theologically, and so on and so forth, all the best argument that he could bring to the table. But then at the end, this friend of his, a common friend, he interrupted, and he said to this man, who was asking this question to Ravi Zacharias. He said, you seem to be concerned about the evil and suffering that you see in this world. And you ask the question of where is God? Let me ask you this question. You are so concerned about the evil and suffering you see outside. Tell me what have you done with the evil and suffering that you see within your own heart? What have you done with the evil and suffering that you see? The wickedness of your own heart that you see within your own uh, heart itself. What have you done? He said. And Ravi Zacharias tells us that there was pin drop silence in the room because finally, finally, it is almost like an arrow that was pierced right through the heart of this businessman. And Ravi Zacharias tells that this man was putting his head down with deep reflection. And then he said, how can you help me? And then Ravi Zacharias and his friend had the privilege of leading him 
to Christ as a better response to life itself. So what is the response to the problem of evil and suffering? I started with a song by Justin Hayward. Why is it that we don't get a response when we knock at the door? Justin Hayward goes on to actually say, I'm looking for a miracle in my life. I'm looking for someone to change my life. I'm looking for a miracle in my life. I'm looking for someone to change my life. The answer Hayward sought was an inner miracle. That was the response that he sought for the problem and the questions that he was seeking. Friends, I know of no better response than the person of Jesus Christ to the problem of evil and suffering.